If you would like to uh, follow along with the slides that I'm showing here on your own device, then please go to that URL here or uh, snap the QR code that I'm putting up here as a really big one as well. Uh, please do that if you have any kind of vision acuity issues or you're simply sitting at the back of the room, please make use of this. And also if you happen to be photosensitive and um, you're prone to migraines and you can't stand staring at a bright screen for a really long time, do this as well because you're going to see this little hamburger menu at the bottom there and uh, you're going to be able to uh, change the color scheme uh, to uh, white on black, so on a dark background. And that might be just a little bit easier on your eyes and therefore on your brains. So if you want to use that. <coughs> I'll keep this up for a few more seconds if there's uh, some people that still want to snap the QR code. And then let's get started. Now this being Config Management Camp, uh, I think it's fairly safe to assume that everyone around here knows Ansible, at least to some degree, right? Who knows Ansible? Show me your hands. If you know Ansible, okay, great. Keep your hand up if you've used Ansible in anger, so actually used it to maintain and deploy production systems. Keep your hands up if you've reported an Ansible issue or, or a feature request or something like that. Okay, leave your hands up if you've actually sent a pull request or maybe you're maintaining a, a collection or something like that. All right, excellent. Okay, great. So, can safely assume that everybody in here is reasonably familiar with Ansible. Uh, oh, there we go again. We'll right. be back in a second. All right, I'm going to have to sort of dart back and forth here. Uh, all right, so since we've now established that you're all familiar with Ansible, it's probably safe to assume that you've also seen this at some point. That is the main GitHub repo uh, for Ansible. It has the whole commit history of the entire Ansible project all the way back to, as it happens, quite nearly exactly 10 years ago. The Ansible got its start in February of 2012, precisely uh, February the 23rd, 2012. It was a Thursday and it, it saw the first commit to Ansible and it simply read Genesis. That was the whole commit message. Uh, funnily enough, so keep that in mind, February 23rd, 2012. The Wikipedia article on Ansible has the initial release date as February 20th, 2012. So three days earlier, citation needed, which I always thought was a little bit, was a little bit cute. Okay, anyway, so if you've seen the Ansible GitHub repo, you have uh, probably noticed something that I think, at least according to my recollection, has been there pretty much from the jump, pretty much from the get-go, uh, which is this thing that's under the little about heading, the, uh, the repo description. At least I got my start with Ansible in late 2012, early 2013. I think I remember it's been this way, or that, uh, that description has been that there, pretty much from the jump. And it reads, and I quote, Ansible is a radically simple IT automation platform that makes your applications and systems easier to deploy and maintain. Automate everything from code deployment to network configuration to cloud management in a language that approaches plain English using SSH with no agents to install on remote systems." End quote. The second sentence in here might actually be a little more recent, but the first one is the one that I think I remember as having been there from the get-go. Ansible is a radically simple IT automation platform. Hmm. Would you describe Ansible to somebody who's just getting their start as simple? Like if you're an Ansible shop and you have like a really new junior person coming in and they know nothing about Ansible, would you use the adjective simple to describe Ansible? Probably not. Probably not. But where does that come from? Where does that claim come from? Considering it's been there from the get-go. Well, first of all, whether or not something is simple always depends on compared to what, doesn't it? Compared to what is it simple? And in 2012, when Ansible started, the thing that you would naturally compare it to was the incumbent in the server automation space, and that was, of course, Puppet, 
at the time. I mean, there were others, there was Chef, there was Safe Engine, but you could argue that Puppet was the incumbent, and Puppet had been around since 2005. So if you compare the two projects in 2012, well, yeah, Ansible was simpler um, than Puppet, but just because there was a jolly good lot of things that you could do with Puppet that you couldn't do with Ansible at the time. So one thing to kind of take away from that is new systems, stuff that is newly built, frequently feels simpler than an older thing or an existing thing simply because you can do a lot less with the new thing than with the established thing. I'd argue this is largely due to the fact that for about 90% of software projects or software systems, the following is true. You can design a replacement for the thing in six weeks, you can put out an initial release in six months, and then you spend six years ironing out the edge cases and corner cases. Uh, and for some projects, I think the number is actually 10, so 10 weeks, 10 months, 10 years. Um, but yeah, that's the thing, right? You, the, the, the thing that's been around for longer has already solved more problems. You can do more things with it. And as a system grows and as it develops more features and more capabilities, it's subject to a rather interesting phenomenon which also contributes to growth in its complexity. Who in here has heard of or read this article? Mike Hadlow, The Configuration Complexity Clock. Okay, that's way too few hands going up here. Right? Okay, so let me tell you a few things about that. So this is an article from a, a UK-based developer named Mike Hadlow, who wrote it in 2012. It's almost the same age as Ansible, interestingly. Mike Hadlow is a C-sharp.net developer. Absolutely not a community that I'm in any way involved in, but this is really universally useful. This article is one of those things that, in my humble opinion, every software engineer and every software engineering manager should have read, but few actually have. In that way, it's not entirely unlike Fred Brooks's Mythical Man Month. Now, here's what it says in brief. Please, by all means, do go there, do read this article. It's only a couple of screenfuls. It's really useful, but I'll give, you the, I'll give you the gist of it. So what the configuration complexity clock suggests is that we think of the development state of a system as the face of a clock. And we start at noon or midnight, if you're wired that way. So we start at 12 o'clock. And at 12 o'clock, everything's hard-coded. The system behaves in a certain way. If you want to change how the system behaves in the slightest, you have to change the code, 12 o'clock. Then, as the system evolves, we get to the point of saying, well, some kind of ability to configure things would be awfully nice, and we add configuration values. So those could be actual values in a config file, they could be uh, arguments or options for a command line interface, they could even be environment variables for a container. The environment variables for a container thing was not in the original article because nobody did that at the time, but it's essentially the same principle. So now you're at 3 o'clock. Then you begin to add relationships between your config options. Like for example, you might have, if you're writing a CLI, you might have like some subcommands, and now you are introducing a global mode switch that makes some or all of your subcommands behave differently. So now what you've built is effectively a crude rules engine for your system. And then all of that eventually morphs into a domain-specific language, or DSL, and you've gone to, so the rules engine is 6 o'clock, the DSL is 9 o'clock. And eventually we realize that managing our DSL by hand is like really unwieldy, so we write some code to generate the DSL for us, and it's noon again. We've come one full circle around the clock. Now, Mike Hadlow wrote in 2012 in his article this little quote. He, uh, he wrote, to be honest, I've never seen an organization go all the way around the clock, but I've seen plenty that have got to five, six, or seven, so have done about a half circle around, and feel considerable pain. Now that's, he wrote that in 2012. So with more than a decade intervening, and with the hindsight from that decade, 
this is definitely an oh my sweet summer child moment. Um, so since that article appeared, there have been so many organizations that have taken multiple laps around the configuration complexity clock. And that very much includes many open source software projects. I've seen things that you people wouldn't believe. And Ansible, I don't mean to pick on Ansible in any way, but I think Ansible is really interesting because the configuration complexity clock not only very well describes the evolution of Ansible, but it also describes the evolution of the typical Ansible user. Like the way people typically approach Ansible because what do you do when you first get started with Ansible? Try to remember what you did when you first got started with Ansible. You probably wrote a straight up playbook. You wrote a straight up playbook, it had, it had tasks, it invoked some modules, it did exactly what was written down in the playbook. You could easily follow what the tasks were doing. It was intuitive. Wonderful. Then you realized, well, it would be nice to make some of those values configurable. So you define some, you define some configuration uh, values. You maybe added a VAS file and you moved from 12 to three o'clock. And then you created your first inventory. You aggregated some hosts to groups. You applied roles. You set variables for those. Thereby you built a crude rules engine. You went to six o'clock. And then you noticed, oh, this is nice. I can write my own roles and those roles can have defaults. And in both the roles and the defaults, I can use Jinja 2 templates. And now I, you operate in this very peculiar, very loosely defined, but clearly domain specific language, namely Ansible's weird mix of YAML and Jinja 2 and some straight up Python sprinkled in. So you've reached nine o'clock. And then at some point you probably figured out, oh, hold on. Now I can discover most of what I need to, like most of the variables and most of the information that I need uh, for my inventory automatically, um, at which point I don't even need, uh, I don't even need uh, to, to maintain host vars and group vars files anymore. And you found yourself either writing or using a dynamic inventory driver and boom, you hit 12 o'clock again. Mm -hmm. And of course, the cycle doesn't. <laughs> this, this is this is always very funny when when, when people have so this realization. It's like, oh shit, yeah, yes, yes, exactly. And of course, the cycle doesn't stop there at all because now your inventory driver grows configuration options, etc., etc., ad infinitum. Okay. And lest you think I want to pick on Ansible specifically, this is by no means specific to Ansible at all, right? So if you think of, for example, Terraform, Terraform beeline straight to DSL, right? Um, but I don't know, I, I can only speculate. Maybe they thought by going straight to a DSL, they would not go further around the clock. But of course, people got sick of maintaining HCL by hand and they came up with TerraGround, right? Um, Kubernetes manifests, another example. People got sick of maintaining uh, Kubernetes manifests and now we have Helm charts and customization and a myriad other ways of, of building uh, Kubernetes manifests. So quit pretending that you can run away from the configuration complexity clock. Um, those things that you're doing to ostensibly improve the configuration of your platform, you're not on a linear track. You are very much on a circular track. The next iteration that you think will definitely solve your complexity problem absolutely won't. You're going to find yourself right back at 12 o'clock at some point and then you're essentially starting over. Let me show you examples from another project lest you think I somehow cherry picked Ansible here. And with this one I cannot necessarily assume that you are intimately familiar with it. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of background on it. Um, the project that I'm talking about is OpenEdX. Uh, now OpenEdX is a general purpose learning platform. Um, who in here has heard of Moodle? Okay. If you've heard of Moodle and you have a rough understanding of what Moodle does, you have a rough understanding of what OpenEdX does. They serve very much the same problem domain. Um, Moodle is a PHP code base. OpenEdX is an all Python code base. Um, they have like different degrees of adoption in various regions of the world, but in general, it's a very, like I said, they serve as, as um, 
um, a similar problem domain. And uh, Open EdX came out of, it was originally developed at MIT, a predecessor project uh, called, it was called MITx, and there was initial collaboration with Harvard and Stanford universities. And in 2013, they formed a nonprofit and released the whole shebang under the Afero GPL, the AGPL. So it's been around for more than 10 years. It's, incidentally, it's roughly the same age as Ansible. And it's widely used not just in academia, but also in, in business education, in uh, non-profit educational platforms that are not academic. So for the, for the people who are here from Germany today, for example, uh, if you've heard of Reporterfabrik, Reporterfabrik is another such platform that is built on Open edX. Um, and it's also something that I use in my day job on a daily basis as, as both a courseware author, a maintainer of our own in-house Open edX platform, and also as an occasional Open edX uh, contributor. Not necessarily to Open edX core, but uh, to a variety of adjacent projects. And uh, Open edX is at its core really a Python Django application, or rather a whole array of Python Django applications uh, that all work together. It, it, uh, it contains a learning management system, a courseware authoring system, a bunch of other things. And the reason that I'm mentioning here is that it's full of fantastic examples that illustrate uh, how complexity, once it's been injected into a system, never goes away. It, it does not recede. Complexity is always here to stay. And as a corollary to that, no, you cannot make it go away with abstraction, automation, or encapsulation either, because all that those do is abstract, automate, and encapsulate complexity. They don't make it go away. And if you need any illustration of that, recall what bundled subprime mortgage securities did to the global financial markets in about 2007 and 2008. Right? Just you think you can get rid of complexity somehow by encapsulating thing, things. Uh, now, uh, before I proceed, I want to make one thing really clear. I do not mean to pick on OpenEx here at all, just like I didn't mean to pick on Ansible either. I absolutely do not want to insinuate that there is incompetence in play here in, in any way, shape or form. I am perfectly convinced that what I'm talking about here is really just illustrative of something that applies to substantially all collaborative software development projects or software systems. And the fact that projects like Ansible and OpenEdX and so many others are open source just simply enables us to look into them and investigate and analyze these things, which is eminently a good thing. So with that said, let me give you one of many, many illustrative examples of the permanence of complexity from this project. So courses in OpenEdX are basically files and directories. And you've got um, basically gzip tables as an interchange format, but you have to sort of import those into the system and then um, extract them. And then they have to be stored in something that is basically a shared file system. So, um, you have like a bunch of front-end servers and they need to access this shared file system on the back end. So in about 2012, 2013, they had to make an architect architectural decision on what they would use for that purpose. And apparently they thought, ah, we don't want to use NFS for whatever reason. Uh, they also looked at ClusterFS. They didn't quite trust that. So I had a chat with the developer who was involved in that at one point. And he said, well, we, we looked into that, but we weren't, we weren't particularly happy. Uh, they also didn't trust CephFS. This part is perfectly reasonable for the time because we're talking 2012, 2013. CephFS didn't become actual production ready until 2016. So what they did, what they went with, was this kind of very strange, kind of, sort of, but not quite like file system thingy called GridFS, which is a MongoDB feature. And with that, they made MongoDB more or less a core component or at least a hard dependency of, of the platform. Again, this, we're talking 2012, 2013. I had my start with OpenEdX uh, in late 2015. And even then, so two years after this decision was made, people were thinking, whoops, this was a mistake. Like this, it wasn't a great idea to go with that thing. We should really get rid of this hard dependency on MongoDB. 
and it's now more than 10 years later and the project is still at the stage of yeah we might get rid of it real soon now and it wasn't for lack of trying they they, they did try to re-implement the whole thing basically refactor it all put it pull it out of the open edX core even make it a separate application called block store which would use s3 storage or anything compatible with s3 or perhaps even anything supported by Django storages and the rest of the OpenEdX platform would communicate with that solely via a REST API. And then they found out that that came with like really, really bad performance impact. And then they moved it right back into the OpenEdX core where now you've got basically another thing that doesn't quite replace the old functionality. You still have the dependency on the old thing. You still need to track MongoDB for updates and vulnerabilities and manage that and whatnot. And there's no net reduction in complexity at all. So no matter what you try, complexity does not recede. Let me give you another example from the same project, which is there's something OpenEdX did right from the get-go to its great credit, which was that they didn't just open source this platform code, this Django, whole array of Django applications platform code by itself, because of course, a, you know, a Django application has all sorts of external dependencies, it needs a relational database, it needs this and that and the other thing. Um, so throwing just this over the fence would have made adoption tremendously difficult. So what they did instead, again, to their great credit, from the get-go, they also released all of the tooling that was required to deploy and manage and maintain the platform in an automated fashion. This was largely based on Ansible. There's a bunch of roles and playbooks that they defined for that purpose. Initially, they also had some cloud formation templates, so you could bootstrap stuff on AWS. They dropped support for that at some point but there was very good support for these Ansible roles and Ansible playbooks and so on. And that allowed you to build an architecture like this. You had, so the Ansible playbooks would give you um, a backend. That's what you can see at the bottom, um, bottom uh, uh, left of the, of the slide. It would deploy a backend for you. Uh, it would, uh, you could run this in anything that gave you any kind of virtualization. You could run it in AWS, in uh, VMware, in OpenStack, wherever. It would spin up these three VMs for you. Uh, those would be your database backend. It would uh, deploy a MySQL uh, Galera cluster for you, a MongoDB cluster with MongoDB replication, and a bunch of other services that were needed, such as Memcached, for example, or if you're familiar with Django, you probably know Celery. Celery is this asynchronous task processing queue. It needs a backend that can be either RabbitMQ or Redis, and it would deploy that for you as well. So it will give you that backend. And then you could have as many front-end servers as you liked because these front-end servers were running effectively Django and a Whiskey server and a web server and they were completely stateless. So there was no user data that was uh, stored on them. The way that you would deploy the front-end would be you spin up one VM, you run the Ansible playbooks against it, uh, you uh, shut it down, you take a snapshot and then you redeploy as many of those instances as you liked. If uh, there was, then you might refresh these, um, these snapshots perhaps once a month and, or something like that, or whenever there was a, a new point release or patch release or something, you would also refresh that. Um, and scaling the front end uh, both in and out was also really simple because what you could do is you could spin VMs up and down, you could plug them in and out of a load balancer, fine. So this was all, it was neat, it was cool, it was useful, but unfortunately, over time, as you could do more things with it, as it grew more features and more capabilities, it also became progressively more complicated to use and maintain and somewhat difficult to contribute to. So again, as with the MongoDB content store, block store bit, people desired simplification. How do we simplify? We use containers, right? Containers make everything simpler. Always, right? Containers simplify everything. So um, what happened was a project, initially a third-party project, emerged to run OpenEdX in Docker containers. 
Uh, that project went through a few names, uh, but now it's called Tudor. And of course, uh, it was really simple to fire up an open edX platform with Tudor initially. But just as with the story of Ansible and Puppet, it was simpler because it could do less. Uh, you could have, it was very simple to basically, you know, fire up a, a, a general purpose shrink wrapped out of the box open edX uh, environment. But when it came to actually making some of those modifications that the Ansible playbooks and roles had absolutely exposed, well, that wasn't so simple anymore. Um, and in fact, as soon as it approached something like feature parity, it was, of course, every bit as complex as the Ansible playbooks. And this is interesting. What Tudor actually does is it generates Docker Compose definitions and Kubernetes manifests and Docker files for you. So it is one more lap around the configuration complexity clock. It's code that generates more code in a DSL or arguably three different DSLs in, in that case. But what this also illustrates, what the, what the experience with Tudor also illustrates is um, another very typical problem in complexity management, which is inadvertently, I want to underline, inadvertently making complexity someone else's problem. Let me explain what I, what I mean to this. The, in Tudor, the lead author maintains a policy arguably a very, very sane policy that the project will only accept new features if it benefits a large proportion of Tudor users. That is accepting features into Tudor core. So even if you have come up with a new feature, you'd, you've written the implementation, you're sending a pull request, the author will still say, well, I still want to evaluate, is this actually useful to a large number or a significant proportion, he doesn't say the majority, but a significant proportion of our user base. Otherwise, it doesn't go into core because for those features, there's a plugin system that allows you to effectively implement any feature you like. Again, sounds eminently reasonable. It's a, it's a perfectly fine way to, to sort of approach things. What the lead developer in this case is trying to do is trying to make the project no more complex than absolutely needed for most users. Perfectly fine idea. But what you end up with, and this is not hypothetical, this is actually happening, is you end up with the core of the project essentially being unfit for purpose without its plugins. So Tudor already today has plugins that are required to run an open edX platform. So they're basically core in all but name. But the complexity of managing all these plugins and making them work together, that ends up in the user's lap. In that case, that would be the open edX platform admins lap. And in my experience, it's not uncommon to have to run on the order of 10 plugins for an average open edX uh, platform to achieve some degree of feature parity to that which the Ansible playbooks offered four years ago. So that leads us to our next takeaway, which is pushing complexity downstream does not reduce it. It just makes it someone else's problem. Now, of course, if we are developers or contributors, of course, we want things to be simple or simpler for us as well, not only for the people using our stuff. But we should keep in mind that there is a ratio of upstream to downstream of people actually contributing to the software versus people using it. And that's what? That's one to a hundred, one to a thousand? Depends on what kind of project we're looking at. So if you're looking at a, uh, a very large community-driven project like Kubernetes, Kubernetes has on the order of about 10,000 committers. And by some estimates, the number of Kubernetes clusters in the world is seven digits. So somewhere between one and, and, and nine million. And it's difficult to assess like how many Kubernetes cluster admins per cluster or how many clusters per cluster admin, but it's probably safe to say that the ratio of upstream to downstream for Kubernetes is something like one to a thousand. 
So for every person that's made a commit to landed a commit in Kubernetes, there's about a thousand people using Kubernetes. If you compare that to curl, curl has a committer base of on the order of 1000 and it clearly has well over a billion users. So there the ratio is more like one to a million. So making things simpler for some number of people, developers, while making them more difficult for orders of magnitude, more people, namely the downstream users, that's not a net win. And it's certainly not a reduction in complexity either. If anything, it's a multiplication. So, what do we do? What can we actually do to simplify, to reduce complexity? And if you're still living in your bubble, I really hate to bust it, but the answer is probably nothing. And I do not say this lightly because I do have physics on my side to back me up. You don't know where I'm going with this yet, but you will in a second. So everything that physicists can explain about the universe, like we cannot explain the whole universe, but the stuff that we can explain about the universe, we can explain with three theories. Physicists would love them to be just one, but we haven't really we haven't really achieved that yet. Three theories to explain everything that we know about the universe. General relativity tells us about mass and energy in space, time and gravity, the latter being one of the four fundamental forces of nature. Quantum mechanics and the standard model tell, explains the other three fundamental forces of nature, electromagnetism, the strong force, the weak force. And that in turn explains structure and the nature of atoms and ultimately chemistry. And then finally we have thermodynamics, which among other things explains heat and work and so forth. And thermodynamics has this famous second law, the second law of thermodynamics, that we can explain in various ways. We can say there is no such thing as a perpetual motion machine, or we can say whenever we uh, transform one kind of energy into another kind of energy, we always lose some of that energy to heat. But we can also express the second law of thermodynamics as the total entropy of a system never decreases. Okay, so the total entropy of a system can never decrease. It can stay the same, it can grow, it could grow at various speeds, but it can never decrease. And what does that mean? What is entropy? Entropy is the degree to which something, a system, and a system can be anywhere from a single particle to the universe, is disorderly. Now, more precisely, entropy is a measure for how many possible configurations a system has, but that's effectively saying the same thing because the more possible configurations we have in a system, the more probable it is that the system is in one that isn't useful, so isn't orderly, right? So in effect, the second law states that any system can stay just as orderly as it is now, or it can become more disorderly, but it can never again become as orderly as it once was. And the normal state of the world is that things keep getting more and more disorderly. And you're all familiar with hundreds of examples of this. You can, you can mix two paints in a bucket, but you can never unmix them. The same goes for coffee and milk, or tea and milk, if you're wired that way. Um, you, can, you can scramble an egg and cook it, but you can never return it to the prior protein structure. You can open a container of gas in a vacuum chamber and the gas will disperse but it will never go back into the container. I mean, it might, but the probability is so minute that in fact it won't, right? So this happens everywhere. And there is a very curious consequence from this, which is that this constant growth in entropy is one of the best explanations that physics has for the unidirectional nature of the passage of time, okay? Because the fact that time always goes forwards is kind of confusing because since Minkowski we know that there is no such thing as a separation between space and time. It's this whole four-dimensional thing that we call space-time. But bizarrely enough, motion through space is reversible. Like We can describe anything that's moving through space as a vector. We can flip the signs of that vector. Boom, this thing goes backwards. But 
time only ever goes forwards. That's very peculiar. It's very strange. We can both space and time, this is what we know since Einstein, obey the principles of general relativity, for example. They're, in, they're, they're influenced by mass, right? But motion through time is irreversible. We can never go backwards in time. We can go slower in time or faster in time, as anyone who's seen Interstellar knows, um, but we can never go backward. So reducing entropy, simplifying things, is just as realistic as traveling backwards in time. It's just not happening. But we can do things to hopefully inadvertently speed up the growth of entropy and we can do things to hopefully deliberately slow it down. So what are ways to drive entropy, to accelerate entropy in the kind of systems that we typically manage in software systems? Adding features without gate gating them behind a feature flag. That means that once the feature is rolled out, you have no way to undo it. And any unexpected fallout from your change is not only here to stay, but it continues to accumulate craft, making the mess harder and harder to fix. Right? Adding features without test cases. Great entropy driver. Adding features without test cases means when something breaks in a later edition, you have no clue what actually broke. Adding features without documentation means you have no record of how the system is even expected to behave. So you don't even have a definition of the system being orderly or disorderly. Premature refactoring. So refactoring without first achieving feature. How, who's, who's heard of that, right? Like we're, we're refactoring this, this bit of functionality. Oh, like this little bit of the functionality? We actually don't need that anymore. We can leave that out of the, of, the, of the refactoring, okay? That is an absolutely surefire way to ensure that you're gonna run two or more parallel implementation strands for essentially ever because you can absolutely be damn sure that that one thing that you were absolutely convinced nobody needed broke someone's workflow. And finally, violations of the principle of least astonishment in other words, the system behaving unintuitively will just screw up everything forever. It's just don't, like be aware of the principle of least astonishment and follow it. Because if you don't, it's, everything's going to be terrible. So what does that mean for the people responsible for such systems? Many of you probably are responsible for such systems. What's your job? If you are responsible for a system, it's your job to slow the growth of disorder in that system. You will never be able to reduce disorder and any attempt to do so pits you against a most fundamental law of physics. And laws of physics are a little bit like terrorists. It doesn't make sense to negotiate with them. But you can do your damnedest to slow the growth of entropy in a system that you're responsible for. For example, never land a change without documentation. Always make sure that the documentation update happens simultaneously with change because docs define how the system is supposed to behave. Always follow the principle of least astonishment. Make sure the system behaves in a way that makes sense. And just to be clear, following rule number one is not a free pass for this one. Okay? Yes, if you have a system that behaves unintuitively and, is un and that behavior is undocumented, that's a hundred times worse than the system behaving unintuitively and the behavior being documented. But it's a hundred times better for the system to behave intuitively and be documented. Never merge a feature without a corresponding test case. Always include the test case in the patch that merges the feature. Oh, okay, yeah, so you're adding a new feature. Great, wonderful. We need a unit and we need an integration test for this. It goes into the same pull or merge request. 
It does not land without it. Never send a feature to production without a feature flag. And for when you decide that a particular part of your system needs refactoring, and that happens, and you think that there are some things that that refactor would touch that you're convinced you actually don't need anymore, what you do is you deprecate that feature, you cut a release, you remove that feature, you cut a release, and then potentially weeks or months later, you start refactoring whatever is left to full feature parity. That's a refactoring. Everything else is just duplication and multiplication. And those are all things that any developer, any sysadmin, any operator can do to stem the growth of entropy in a system. But there is something that's a little bit weird, which is that, and I use the term manager in a really broad sense, right? It can be somebody who's actually appointed to like a lead an organizational unit. It can be a, an open source project leader, like whichever. But a lot of managers are entropy accelerators. They, they do exactly the opposite of what they're supposed to do. They speed up the growth of disorder in an organization. So uh, let, me, let me know how familiar this sounds. You have an internal Slack channel, okay? And, um, and communications in that Slack channel are poor and chaotic and nobody can really follow that. How many of you can think of a manager right now whose probable solution to that problem would be, let's have more channels. <laughs> All of them. Yes. Right? And of course, those are then more channels that everybody that previously followed just one channel now has to follow, and that one channel doesn't get retired for another two years. Right? Um, and that's not a singular example. This sort of thing happens all the time. And I don't have a good explanation for that, but I posit it has to do with this weird misguided fetish for this thing that we call leadership, that we, we, we seem to believe that in order to be useful, people must lead, they must do, they must direct. Right? When in, in reality, there's, really, there's at least three, three productive things that people can do when they collaborate, and one of them is not necessarily better than the others. You can lead, you can follow, you can get out of the way. And I chose to paraphrase that patent quote because the original has more profanity, obviously. Um, but sometimes I wish people who are leaders, whether formal or informal, appointed or not, would, uh, would more often choose option two or three out of these, uh, rather than always defaulting to option number one and sort of constantly stirring the pot and creating even more disorder. And I want to mention another thing that people, including but not limited to managers, frequently misunderstand, and that is the KISS principle. Okay? Curiously, we don't seem to agree on, on, this is a tangent, curiously, we don't seem to agree on how that acronym actually expands. So some people prefer the keep it simple, comma, stupid exclamation point rendering, as in keep things simple, you idiot. Um, some people prefer keep it simple and stupid, which I always read as don't try to be complicated, but also don't try to be clever. Um, some people sidestep the stupid issue and they just say keep it small and simple, whichever. We appear to agree that we want to keep things simple and we want to keep them either stupid or small. But however we expand this acronym, there is one bit that's important. It is the KISS principle, not the MISS principle. It's about keeping things simple, not about making things simple. And as such, the, the, the principle as such is quite aptly named because it does remind us that the important bit is to keep things simple while you can, precisely because it's impossible to make things simpler later on. So yeah. Try to keep things simple because you're never going to be able to make them simple. So to wrap this up, keep in mind that new systems, new open source projects, 
new configuration management facilities, new this, new that, new the other thing, is often simpler than something that's already there, simply because it can do less than the stuff that's already there. You won't be able to escape the configuration complexity clock, don't attempt to. But be aware of it. Understand that those things that you're making to your configuration systems, those are not a linear path. They are on a circular path. You will end up at 12 o'clock again at some point. Complexity does not recede. Abstraction, automation, and encapsulation do not make it recede either. Pushing complexity downstream does not reduce it. It might be less of your problem, but it's a lot more of a problem if you do this. If we're talking about a person who is a leader of any kind, formal or informal, appointed or not, their job is to slow the growth of disorder in the bit of the system that they're responsible for. And you want to keep in mind to keep things simple because you cannot make them simple. So, quit simplifying. That's my talk. Thank you.